So, good morning everybody, welcome. Uh, my name is Eugen Popa and uh, I will be talking to you for the next uh, hour, hour and a half today. If you want to interrupt at any point, um, please feel free to do so. I also have, during the slides, I have some uh, questions for you. And um, does this have that raise hand option? Oh, it does, yeah. So raise your hand if you want to say something and I'll do my best to follow the, um, the hands that are being raised. If not, just uh, intervene. Uh, it's also totally fine. So let me now go to my presentation. Let me say a few words about myself. I know we haven't met because I'm not an um, active part of this uh, course. I have been invited as a guest uh, lecturer. So my name is Eugen Oktav Popa. I have a background in uh, communication, communication studies. And uh, after I've, I'm from Romania, so I did that in Romania as a bachelor. And then I came to Amsterdam and I did my master's in uh, argumentation studies. So a bit more focused on situations where people have differences of opinion or conflicts or disagreements. In 2016, I finished my um, PhD in scientific argumentation. So I was looking at how uh, scholars, scientists, academics um, resolve their differences of opinion in context of controversy or debate. And after that, I, um, I zoomed out a bit. So not looking just at how scholars talk among themselves, but also at how they talk how this institution of science, uh, quote unquote, talks with society. So how scholars talk with uh, business representatives or um, policymakers or civil society organization. So in doing that, I did um, several research projects at uh, Free University in Amsterdam, so FU uh, in Wageningen, and uh, now at uh, Twente. Um, my interest, as you might uh, already see from my uh, CV and my background, is in uh, conflict, by which I don't mean when people start yelling at each other and everything becomes uh, horrible, but when there, is, when there are different standpoints, and more maybe when there are different perspectives, um, fundamentally different perspectives, or paradigms if you want, and uh, yet people need to... Uh, collaborate. People need to make a decision. How does that work? So because of that, I am um, working also with the philosophy of uh, pluralism, the um, concept of moral overload, both of which we'll, um, we'll, we will discuss about uh, today. And um, of course, I'm not just interested in these topics on a very general philosophical uh, level, but I'm also interested in their application in uh, specific um, for specific technologies, and I have worked so far with uh, hydrogen, so green hydrogen, and my current project has to do with uh, artificial photosynthesis. Now, the thing is, while I'm um, doing this, I cannot really... Hmm. I cannot... I don't also have the Chrome tab open, so... I think the best thing to do is for you to assume that I cannot see the chat. So if you want to intervene, just interrupt me and then I'll stop talking and we can, uh, we can discuss, okay? Because I have my PowerPoints on uh, full screen. Okay, um, so let me go back to presentation mode. This is me in a nutshell. Um, what we're going to do today is... I think the best way to see it is we're going to look at responsibility with um, philosophical uh, spectacles, with philosophical lenses. And by that, I don't mean that we're going to ask incredibly uh, general or incredibly abstract questions and sort of ponder on concepts, you know. But um, I also don't mean, by the way, that we're going to throw in tens of thousands of names of philosophers and said, well, Plato said that, and you know, Kant said that, and all that. I just mean that we want to uh, briefly take a very critical look at this idea that science needs to be more responsible, or that science needs to be responsible to start with. Um, what, is that, what does that mean, and how does, how does that fit into uh, 
our uh, general, more general conception of being critical. You know, if people are being critical of science, they say it has to be more responsible. Well, how does that work? How does that work, really? That's the main uh, question. So I will start with two tales. I will start with two uh, stories. And I'll keep coming back to these stories. So um, my advice is to pay, atten pay attention um, to, the, to the main lines and the two stories. There's also some uh, trick questions I want to ask at one point. So if you want to participate, um, you know, follow, uh, follow me through these stories. And then I want to make this distinction that I also announced in the, um, in the title, the distinction between a procedural approach to responsibility and a substantial approach. And I want to, after that, sort of play with these uh, concepts and show you what, uh, what the difficulties are in each case, in each case what um, advantages and disadvantages are. I want to build the, the talk today around this uh, distinction. And then I will um, draw some conclusions, and I want to also tell you something about, you know, looking forward, especially for your projects and your um, essays based on this lecture, what that, uh, what that all means. And then at the end we have time for Q&A, but again, I don't, um, I don't it's, it's not incredibly comfortable to talk for an hour and a half completely. Uh, at one point you start wondering, is there anybody at the other end, you know, is there anybody listening? So um, please intervene whenever you want, and we might have to park some of the questions for the big Q&A session uh, at the end. So here we go. I'm going to start with uh, two tales of uh, responsibility or irresponsibility. It remains for us to decide today uh, during this lecture. And as you can see from... Um, as you can see from the design of these uh, title slides, I've been watching a lot of Ozark uh, recently. So that is my uh, tip of the hat to them. Okay, we're going to start with what is probably the most well-known story of... well-known case study, if you want, of uh, irresponsibility. It appears in so many papers and books on responsible innovation. It is classical in many ways, as you'll see, and I think everybody that has been in this field for even a bit, like you are, um, should, you know, take this as a, as a standard uh, case. So, what is TEL? TEL is tetraethyl lead, and um, it was invented in the early 20th century, because um, especially General Motors was producing more and more powerful uh, engines, for which you need more and more uh, compression, of course, to get more energy out of the fuel. Now, as you compress, um, as you get to higher uh, compressions, you have this uh, knocking uh, effect, and you can also hear it um, when you when you look at um, old films that that have this audio of old cars. You can also hear that uh, knocking effect. And the problem with the knocking effect is that it, you, you lose some of that uh, extra energy that you get from the compression. So at one point it might not even make sense to get to higher compression. So that's the knocking effect was a big problem for the auto industry in the 1920s. So General Motors um, gave uh, Thomas Midgley, Thomas Midgley Jr. actually is his full name, um, the task of solving this knock uh, effect problem. What he did was he went into the lab and he virtually experimented with hundreds and th uh, hundreds of um, substances. Because the idea was, well, gasoline is gasoline. There's not much you can do uh, to that. That's how it is uh, synthesized. There's not much you can do to the bare product. But you can add, you can create additives that make gasoline it has to do with when and how it burns, that it burns a bit more equally. So he started looking into these many uh, additives. Well, as a result of that, um, and also as a result of uh, other um, inventions of his, an historian uh, said about Thomas Midgley that he had more impact on the atmosphere than any other single organism in Earth's history. Think about that. Think about that label. Um, he had more impact on atmosphere than any other single organism in Earth's uh, history. Why? 
Well, Thomas Midgley settled on, uh, as you can see from the label, on lead. So leaded gasoline um, is an, an enhanced product, and it does indeed prevent this uh, knocking uh, effect. Well, it was known then, as it is known now, that lead is toxic. Uh, actually, they found um, writings from the, from the Roman uh, times when um, people were aware of the toxicity of the, of the lead. But um, nobody was really understanding uh, the effects as something that happens uh, both on the spot when you're subjected, to, when you're exposed to lead, and long term. And that's where the problem started to appear. Because lead is very difficult to break down. Which means that lead accumulates. And hardly ever, let's say, reacts to anything else. So hardly ever disappears. Which means that this invention, so the leaded uh, gasoline, has effects that we still see today and has effects on a long uh, term. And uh, I will show you uh, later that it is connected to, has been connected to developmental issues in various generations. In other words, because of the lead accumulated in plants, or let's move uh, to the basis, in the soil, which then transfers to plants, which then we either eat or we eat the animals that eat the plants. So because lead is introduced into the biological cycle, it eventually accumulates in us. And this has been related to, as you will see, um, developmental impairments, right? The developmental uh, problems in uh, generations of children. And people have connected that to higher crime rates. Importantly, at the time when Midgley was experimenting with all that, there was a well-known alternative that was working. It wasn't working just as well, but it was working, and other companies and other country were, countries were using it. And that is just plain old ethylene, right? Ethyl alcohol. Um, and you can synthesize that from uh, you know, crops and fruits and all that. So it's an organic product. Now, there, although alcohol worked just well enough, it wasn't amazing as leaded gasoline, but it was just good enough, um, it had one problem, and that was alcohol was everywhere. Everybody could add alcohol, and everybody did add alcohol who knew about this uh, to their gasoline. And that is a problem because you cannot patent something that everybody has access to. Also, alcohol, because you synthesize it from organic products, would not be, you know, would have to be synthesized by someone else. The auto industry, General Motors and Standard Oil and all those companies are industrial um, gigantic uh, conglomerates, right? So it has to be a product that they synthesize uh, themselves chemically. And they calculated that if they have this in-house, if they have this product, if they make it themselves and then export it and put it into their own gasoline, they can earn two more cents per gallon. So, of course, historians have jumped to say, well, look at that. Because Thomas Midgley and General Motors wanted two more cents per gallon, we can now discover lead in the penguins in the Antarctica. I don't know if this is still the case, but it was at one point in the 1990s that they, they did this test and it, was, uh, it could be uh, discovered. So lead propagates in that way. And very briefly, you can look at this, uh, the lead crime hypothesis. And what you see in those uh, two graphs is what I just explained uh, briefly. So the blue line is uh, the number of violent crimes. And the um, green line is blood level uh, lead, right? Measurements of lead in the blood of children. Of course, the years have to be, um, the, the years in the green row underneath and the years in the blue row underneath are uh, set off by two decades or something. So by the time those children end up being adults.
And yeah, say what you want, but that image is is kind of telling. It's um, of course of, it's corrected for all kinds of other uh, covariances, right? So um, social economic status, psychological uh, um, features of uh, people involved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, it doesn't mean, of course, that lead is the sole cause of this uh, increase in crime rate. But it's very hard to look at that at that uh, correlation, to look at that table and say and say, well, nah, it's nothing. You know, it doesn't have any effects. Okay, this was um, this was the first uh, this was the first story. This was the first tale. Let's move directly to the second one, and this is the story of uh, DDT. I'm not exactly sure what DDT stands for. Uh, D chlor. It's a big chemical name. It doesn't matter. Um, it, you can look it up. Um, DDT um, was discovered uh, by accident by a student who was just trying to synthesize some new formula, some new uh, complex molecule. Uh, but it was only the, like, the um, effects as a, um, the efficiency as a pesticide was only discovered uh, much later. And um, the one who did this discovery also obtained the Nobel Prize, um, which is interesting because apparently you can win the Nobel Prize not just for discovering in chemistry, not just for discovering a, a new molecule, but also discovering its applications, which I didn't know. But um, this application turned out to be absolutely amazing. Uh, DDT is, by all standards, an extremely, extremely efficient uh, pesticide. Um, and because of that, it was um, widely used. It was unregulated or unrestricted in any case for uh, many years. As prisoners came from uh, concentration camps, but also prisoners of war, uh, fleas were a big uh, problem. And of course, we know that fleas can, um, are the, the vectors for many, many diseases. So in the 50s, uh, people were, were, were literally sprayed with uh, DDT. It, w it came as a powder, so you could uh, pulverize it, you can spray it onto surfaces or onto people. And um, there's actually a story of, um, which made DDT famous, which was the, the big break for DDT as a chemical on the scene. Uh, there was a typhus, uh, typhus outbreak in uh, Italy uh, after the war, and um, it, it completely eradicated the outbreak within a matter of weeks. So that's when policymakers and governments worldwide said, this is, uh, this is the chemical we need. Now, um, after the war, I've, uh, you might know this, but there's also the post-war era is also the beginning of the um, environmental movement. What you experience nowadays, every day with uh, climate change and um, environmental uh, bodies and um, all that discourse, the narrative of uh, save the planet and all that, is in fact a child of this early environmental movement. And to many, uh, Rachel Carson, which you can see there in the, the first photo up, um, is something like the, um, the first big figure and maybe the, 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 the pioneer in the field of environmental, of, in the environmental movement. And Rachel Carson wrote uh, a book uh, called uh, Silent Spring, and I encourage you to look for that book and uh, read it. And its main, let's say, bad guy in that book is DDT. So, um, basically, very poetically and um, uh, with a lot of... Um, with many examples and very, how do I say this, very, um, yeah, very impactfully, uh, Rachel Carson wrote a book about uh, DDT, and in essence, within a decade, DDT was banned all over the world. Um, now, what were those effects? How did uh, Rachel Carson came up with this, have such a powerful uh, influence? By the way, her, her name also... Uh, had the same uh, effect. So we went from this uh, virtually unknown biologist to, you might have not have heard of Rachel Carson, but everybody in the 60s and 70s heard of uh, Rachel Carson. 
Well, uh, DDT was uh, primarily bad for story about that. Uh, DDT was primarily bad for uh, the environment, and um, one of the few uh, warm-blooded animals that have the same um, effects or like feel the same effects as we do are birds, and um, that's also where the title comes from, right? Silent Spring is a spring where the birds don't um, sing. So um, Rachel Carson wrote about the effects of DDT on insects and birds and humans and uh, the, um, the effects on uh, the human skin, but also um, uh, cancer triggering uh, mutations and or like mutations, uh, uh, carcinogens. And even before the book was published, even before the book was uh, published, JFK, uh, well, JKF in the apparently in the text, JFK uh, received questions about it and created a committee for investigating the effects of uh, DDT. And what they what they found is that also not only are they they bad for uh, the human body and for birds and for insects, but they're not even that good. Uh, it's not is not even that good as a pesticide because at one point insects develop either resistance to the chemical or they learn insects learn to avoid it so they don't sit on that uh, on that surface uh, anymore but they just go somewhere else and then you know somebody who's not sprayed uh, gets uh, infected so international bans uh, followed after this uh, the problem is, of course, that DDT was still very much needed in many poor countries because it was the only workable, cheap, efficient solution against malaria. Um, and the reason it was so efficient, it was precisely the reason why it's so toxic and so bad for you, which is that it has what is called a high residual efficiency, which means that it keeps being active, not for um, macroorganisms, but it keeps being active uh, for as much as three months, around three months actually, it can also go uh, more. So the ban also resulted in uh, return of malaria epidemics in many countries. As we know, malaria is um, transmitted by that um, mosquito, uh, actually many uh, species of mosquitoes, um, so those mosquitoes had less, um, fewer problems and encountered the chemical less and less, which means that they uh, lay their eggs on more surfaces, which means that malaria epidemics uh, return. Actually, the WHO reversed their advice on uh, DDT, eventually, of course, much more restricted, and ended up being a story of, um, well, what is the worst of the possible worst case uh, scenarios here and um, DDT is still uh, allowed and used in some uh, third world countries. I think in, uh, in Africa is also uh, primarily used um, in southern countries where it is imported from, uh, from India. So this is, the, um, this is the second story. This is the story of the DDT. So I think I don't know if I managed to bring that to surface, but I think that you felt that the idea of responsibility is very much in the air, right? It's very, it's very difficult to look at these cases and not feel that both of them are one way or another, um, that our evaluation, that, that they trigger normative feelings, right? We're not just describing this. There's good guys and bad guys. There's good um, effects or good outcomes and bad outcomes, and that's what uh, the stories are about. Okay, so um, this is the first moment where you can uh, intervene, so please open your microphone, and um, I'm going to exit it now, actually, uh, so that I can see if someone writes something in the, in the chat. So, um, well... No, I cannot see my questions. Um, yeah, tell me what you think about these uh, two stories. Uh, what can we say about the responsibility in the two cases? Don't be afraid to go uh, intuitively on this. I haven't introduced anything, so I'm not expecting you to use any specific you know, theoretical notion of uh, responsibility. Uh, 
Um, who was irresponsible? So, of course, we can say, well, there's uh, some irresponsible conduct, but who exactly is uh, irresponsible? And um, I hope you felt that the stories are kind of different. They had different uh, endings. And maybe you can have a go at the question of what exactly is that difference uh, that is relevant for my... So think about yourselves and your own intuitions for my evaluations of uh, responsibility. Anybody want to join? You guys haven't been... Uh, haven't woken up yet? Some people are uh, typing. I would say the responsibility is on every party. Yeah, that's a very, um, very good remark because um, there, there's also this idea of a shared responsibility uh, in the literature on responsible innovation. And yeah, it's, 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 it's more complex than how you say it, but the gist of it is exactly that. Responsibility when it comes to science, of course, by the way, I'm only talking and we're only talking about what it happens with uh, scientific uh, processes and scientific outputs. In other questions, uh, things might be different. Think about, you know, murder or something like that. It's hard to say, well, responsibility is shared. But when it comes to the institution of science, Indeed, responsibility seems to have seems to be dissipated on uh, the parties uh, involved. So yeah. Yeah, government. That's a good. Uh, that's a good point. Um, having worked with um, with the Dutch, what's the translation? Dutch Health Council. So it's EDVM. Um, I can tell you that. Uh, so Hamza is saying that government is responsible for not inspecting effectiveness. Well, it wasn't the effectiveness. It's more like the effects. So the, the, the unwanted uh, effects. Because the effectiveness of DDT was very much uh, well known and it was easy to uh, inspect or to determine in the lab. But indeed, in these stories, I think that is also a very good... Um, Remark, and this goes to show that there's a lot about responsibility that we can find out just by looking at our intuitions of cases. Um, the one with the highest power is the one with the biggest responsibility. You know, like in Spider-Man, the with great power comes great responsibility, right? That's not just a saying from a comic book. It's it it touches upon um, very fundamental intuition of ours, which is. The more power you have over things and things go bad, the more responsible you are for things having gone bad. So that's a very good observation. Um, yeah, so General Motors, of course, um, let me tell you this, uh, a bit of um, um, you know, detail into the case. I also put some references at the end if you want to look into that. General Motors not only knew about the effects of lead, but they had actively tried to cover those. And not only that, but they commissioned research in-house, their own researchers, etc. Um, and virtually published research that was bogus. Published research that was not well done and... Um, the conclusions of that research was that well, it's all uh, it's all good. Also, it was a trademark um, um, substance, right? So you couldn't just um, uh, take it yourself and do whatever you want with it because they didn't have, um, you know, they didn't know how the the, the substance was made, right? Um, okay, so. Let's move forward. I, I see there's uh, something else. Short-term uh, benefits and effects are more taken into account than longer-term benefits. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, it, 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 again, <laughs> sorry to say that every time. It's not that this is my uh, response all the time. But, yeah, there's also that um, time element involved. And we'll talk about that, actually, a lot in this uh, lecture. It seems to be 
to, to quote another um, saying, penny wise and pound foolish, right? It seems to be a matter of, ooh, we look very closely at the benefits and we can eradicate malaria, it's cheap, it's effective, but we don't look at the um, long-term effects. So um, this, 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 this dialogue between different values, the values that you get, uh, immediately and the values that you might hurt uh, later on is also a part of the discussion on responsibility. Thank you all for the remarks. Or they are um, surprisingly close to what I'm about to say. Um, but I would like to keep stressing this, uh, this um, question, this last question. And don't worry if you cannot answer it now because I'll get back to it. What is the relevant difference between the two cases? Did you have different intuitions when I described those cases? And if so, what is the relevant uh, difference? I'm going to continue with the presentation. So if you put something in the chat, I won't see it until uh, later. So you can um, jump in if you want to say something. Okay, now I promised I would make a distinction between two approaches to responsibility. So let's start and just um, talk about the first one. 11 16th so yeah we'll take a break in about 20 minutes hopefully we can just finish the procedural part and then move to the substantial one after the break good what is this procedural approach to responsibility that i'm uh, talking about well the term procedure references the idea of some abstract rules or some abstract ideal model or reason, very generally thought, eh? what is reason, what is the good, to be opposed to the messy, unruled, suboptimal process, reality, ideal model versus actuality, reason versus practice. This is the main philosophical distinction that we refer to when we say something is procedural. The rules... Uh, of chess, right, are procedural rules. That's the ideal model of chess, right? Well, there are actually also strategic rules in the game, but an ideal model of how things should be, we refer to that as the procedure. The reality, the low-level, suboptimal, messy, um, complicated, complex uh, reality, that's the process. So you have this procedure versus process distinction that we bring into discussion. Now, a procedural approach to responsibility would be to set up rules right, for how to conduct yourself or how people should conduct themselves or how institutions should conduct themselves responsibly. Right? And this is very much the mainstream notion of responsibility. In other words, if you ask people working within this approach, they might not think about it as, oh, I'm working with the procedural approach, but for those that are, and we'll uh, mention some later, um, what is responsibility? What is responsible innovation? How do we get responsible innovation? They will come up with rules for how to conduct yourself responsibly. Again, we'll talk about some of those rules. Um, and those are the red parts, right? It should be like that, not otherwise. It should be like this, not uh, otherwise. And this idea of responsibility is actually built into, you might have heard uh, about the Horizon 2020 uh, program and also the newest one, Horizon Europe. It's built into the idea of RRI, as it's known, Responsible Research and Innovation. So, if you look at Horizon 2020, and if you look at Horizon Europe and try to ask yourself, what is responsible innovation? Well, responsible innovation is the following of certain rules for how we should conduct ourselves, right? Now, uh, I want to say two things and then I'll explain them later, but I just want to point them out now. Um, procedural responsibility takes something that is called the Collingridge uh, dilemma as a point of departure, and I will... Uh, explain it and discuss it in detail, and uh, typically results in what are called uh, requirements, right? I, I actually said that many times, but I think the word requirements uh, needs to be said because it is the standard word that people go to when they talk about the uh, innovation process in this 
responsibility uh, version of it. Before I move on to explain these two points, I want to draw your attention to a quote, and I, I, will, I will nail that into your uh, attention span over and over again, because I think it's a very interesting quote. If we're, if we're to be critical and philosophical about you know, two hours on a Monday morning, we might as well go into every corner. Uh, Paul uh, Feyerabend, in a book called uh, Against Method, I actually, now that I'm saying this, I don't think it's from that book. I think it's from a different book that is called uh, Science in a Free Society. Said, reason and practice, and now you see what he's referring to, right? Because I made that distinction. Reason and practice are just two kinds of practice. So keep that in the back of your mind. Put it on the back burner and let it, let it simmer there for a bit. And think about that because I, I will want to get back to that, uh, that quote. Reason and practice are just two kinds of practice. Think about what that means. Okay, what is the Colin Gridge uh, dilemma? Well, it comes from uh, this guy, David Colin Gridge, who wrote a very interesting book called The Social Control of Technology. By the way, uh, tetraethyl lead was discussed there, but the thing is, uh, the book appeared in the 1980s, so lead was just f had just recently been banned but he had no idea how long it would take for tetraethyl lead to actually be banned all over Europe so i was born in romania i'm 32 now i don't know how old you guys are maybe 20 something like that in my time you could still get leaded gasoline from the gas station you had leaded gasoline and unleaded gasoline uh, which is crazy to think about so the 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 um, removal of this technology, so the removal of leaded gasoline from industrial and transportation systems took more than half a decade, uh, half a century. Anyway, that's just uh, his case study. So what is the dilemma? The dilemma is that in the beginning, it's a dilemma of control. And think about that ideal versus practice, right? It triggers um, inclinations to control. In the beginning, when the technology is, let's say, recently discovered or just in the area of being a, a promising, promising monstrosity, as uh, some philosopher put it. So when it's young, you can ban it, you can change it. There's a lot of, flex, a lot of flexibility, right? But you don't really know the negative impact. It's very difficult to predict what exactly the negative impact is. That's the first horn of the dilemma. Later... When technology is established, incumbent, it's part of the system, it is the system, then there is a lot of knowledge about the effects, but intervention becomes a problem because it is either difficult to change for reasons that you can imagine, think of the internet and all other technologies that are now a part of our lives, or extremely costly, or maybe the train is lost, right? By the time you get to intervene, the negative effects are already there. So you can say that there's an inverse relationship between knowledge and flexibility, and you have that in the, in the table and in the figure there. The more you go into time, the less ability to intervene you have, the more knowledge you gain. So the question is, how do you yeah, social control of technology. How do you control uh, the social effects of uh, technology? Now, I don't want to give you the answer right now because, of course, we'll talk about many answers and you'll see that there's a, there's a wide area of um, approaches to how to answer this question. But again, if we are to be philosophical for two hours, let's stop and realize how this approach um, already forms the kind of questions we are asking, right? When we look at technology from the perspective of the Colin Gridge dilemma, we ask questions of control, we ask questions of intervention, regulation, right? Adjustment of the messy process to fit the ideal procedure, of the, of the messy blue stuff to fit the ideal red one. And it becomes a matter of, okay, when should I best intervene? So timing and how should I best intervene? So means. 
Um, okay, I, I have a, a small thing to say. Um, everybody talks about Colin Gridge's dilemma, but he's not. It's a very old um, idea that has been taken up and chewed up by so many political philosophers that it's our duty to say this. He did not came up with this uh, idea. So this quote is from Machiavelli's famous uh, treaty, The Prince. Uh, I'm going to read it very quickly, and you'll see for yourselves that it's, it's the same idea, just 400 years earlier. When provided for in advance, these disorders can be cured. But if you wait until they are upon you, medicine is too late. The disease has become incurable. It's the same with pulmonary tuberculosis. Doctors say that it is easy to cure in its incipient stage, but hard to recognize. Remember those negative effects that you cannot see. Yet as the time goes on, if not recognized and treated at the outset, it becomes very easy to recognize and hard to cure. So is it with matters of state. So Machiavelli is advancing a metaphor, right? This is how it is with governance, and in our case, the governance of technologies. When recognized in advance, a gift granted to prudent men only, whatever, illness appearing in a state are quickly healed. But when they are not recognized and they are allowed to intensify so that everybody recognizes them, they can no longer be remedied. And this metaphor of the state as the body is a very old one. We just need to put it out there. It's, it is calling rage dilemma, but it's a very old idea, right? Okay, now, Let's give an example. Um, actually, we'll, we'll, this contains many examples uh, in one. One of the papers that... Um, the main paper, I think, that you should read on the procedural notion of responsibility is this very famous paper published in Research Policy called Developing a Framework for Responsible Innovation. And um, it is basically a review of everything that we will now call procedural approaches to responsibility, and they distill a set of principles. They distill a set of rules. Remember, how do we intervene? How do we control? So basically, if you read Developing a Framework for Responsible Innovation very carefully, you have a bird's eye view of what happens in uh, the field. And they come up with these uh, requirements. Let me say something just so that you avoid being confused. Um, still go and colleagues call these requirements process requirements. Um, which doesn't mean they, they, they use English incorrectly, but it just means that the requirements are to be applied to the process. So don't be confused about the requirements are still making up the procedure. They just apply to the process. It's like saying player rules, right? The rules apply to the players. Okay, so they come up with four requirements that are, and I quote, important characteristics of a more responsible vision of innovation, which can, in our experience, be heuristically helpful for governance. Now, what does that mean? Heuristically helpful for governance. Well, governance means uh, governing together, right? That's what governance means. So, uh, taking care of technology together. That's what they're saying. And heuristically, that heuristic just means uh, taking that as a guiding principle, right? Taking that as uh, taking the rules as answers to question: What should I do? What should I? How should I control it? When should I intervene? Etc. So basically, what they're saying: If you want to have responsible innovation, this is how the process must look like or responsible science, I'm not sure. Oh, no, the responsible innovation. But the words responsible innovation and science governance and all that, they're interchangeable. So they come up with four um, rules, or four, four process requirements, they call it, yes. And I'm not going to go very much into detail because they, they explain it pretty well. And I, I think just go read the, the, the paper for the extended version of this. But the rules are that responsible innovation must be an anticipative uh, or anticipative um, process. In other words, we should constantly look ahead. Remember the comment from one of your colleagues. It has to be a reflexive process, which means that we should take a look at our um, assumptions and start to be critical of technology, obviously, because this is the whole point, you know, that we have to be uh, critical of technology. It has to be an inclusive process, 
which means that um, if we compare it to uh, the Thomas Midgley, well, in essence, I could get, you know, um, leaded gasoline in uh, Brasov, Romania in the 1990s because Thomas Midgley did something in his lab with absolutely no supervision and the process was not inclusive, right? So inclusiveness needs to be part of the process and uh, responsiveness, which is just another word for uh, flexibility, we should, the, the innovation process should be kept responsive in the sense that if there are indications that is wrong, putting it very simply, we should respond, we should, we should uh, move the trajectory, the innovation path should go um, somewhere else. Now, they also come up with um, a list of questions and you have to hold on to your hats because things are going to become a bit uh, complicated now. And I want to explain this table because I don't want you to lose sight of this, um, of this uh, distinction. They say, well, lines of questioning on responsible innovation, there are product questions. So, how will the risks and benefits be distributed? What other impacts can we anticipate? How might these, so the impacts change in the future, etc., etc. So, asking questions of responsible innovation means asking questions about the product. The product in this case is what we've called uh, the process, right? In other words, the messy reality. So how is this messy reality uh, taking place? Now, forget, uh, ignore my drawings for a second. I'll, cl I'll, I'll uh, clarify. There are also what they call process questions, and these are, let's say, the standard process questions that you can think of when you ask, hey, how is innovation going on in light of how it should go on? So, uh, how should standards be drawn up and applied? How should risks and benefits be defined and measured? Who is in control? Again, ignore the drawings. Who is in control? Who is taking part? Etc. Etc. So, when we look with our bag of rules, and when we look at reality, we should ask these questions. And there are questions regarding uh, the purpose. Why are researchers doing it? Who will benefit? Uh, what are they going to gain? What are the alternatives? And before I explain the drawing, and I'll explain the drawing in a bit, what they see is that these questions, and in fact many others, are tackled in different ways by different approaches. So, in the if you want to say, okay, I'm going to apply the procedural approach, there isn't really um, one-size-fits-all uh, toolkit, right? You have many different toolkits, you have many different approaches, everybody comes up with their own name, you know, every uh, respectable school there has some sort of acronym for their name, and everybody comes up with their tools, but what they're saying is, these are, generally speaking, the kind of questions that are being asked. Okay. Now, in light of our distinction, because later we will want to make a distinction between this procedural approach and something else, right? Even though it's the mainstream, we want to be a bit critical about it. I want you to notice that everything that is um, circled in blue, right, is a question about what we call the process, right? Keep in mind, let me go back to the color so that you have it in. The reality, how things go, is the blue one. The ideal model is the red one, right? So if you go and look at these questions, they all ask, how is reality, basically, right? How will the risks be distributed? What impact can we anticipate? Who is in control? Uh, who is taking part, what are the alternatives, etc., etc. I hope you feel that these are questions about the reality. They are questions about how things go, what we call the process. Ignore the, their distribution for now. On the other hand, the two questions at the top of the process questions are questions about the rules, they're not so much questions about the reality, the messy reality. They're questions about the rules. Because they ask, essentially, what rules should we be using? Right? Notice, they have the should there, whereas uh, others one, other ones don't. So that is a, it should ring a bell. It should say, well, okay, so now they're 
asking questions about the normative apparatus, the set of rules. How should standards be drawn and applied? How should risks and benefits be defined and measured? Aha! Uh -huh. So these are normative uh, questions. And in fact, because this normativity can also be carried by specific terms, that second question that I circle some terms into uh, also has this sort of normative uh, force because they're asking, are these motivations transparent? Right? In other words, they should be transparent. There's the, the, the word transparent is value-laden, value right? It's, 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 it, it's a value term. So they're not asking, okay, what is the opacity uh, level, right? They're asking, are they as transparent as they should be? They're asking, are they in, as in line with public interest as they should be? Now, I know this can be a bit dizzying uh, because there's a lot that I'm throwing at you, but if I were to summarize it, I would say, well, in this table, there is in fact another distinction that crosses through what they call product, process, and purpose. And that is questions about the reality, which are the ones in blue, and questions about this tool, this toolkit, these, these, these uh, instruments that we use to intervene in reality, right? So, what, do they, what is their answer, essentially? Well, they say, these are the four dimensions, or they call them dimensions as well, just to, ma just to make sure that they are as confusing as possible. Um, so, they are, there are these requirements, anticipation, reflexivity, inclusiveness, and responsiveness. And what they end up, as I said, is like a collection of approaches and schools of thoughts of thought that deal with these um, dimensions, right? In other words, at one point in the in the um, in their paper, you will find this table that you can see on the right side, and basically what they have is they basically open up the drawer, and they said, "These are the tools that we have." Imagine going to a handyman, and you say, "Well, I have a problem. My my innovation is kind of irresponsible," and he sort of opens up the drawer and you see all these tools, right? This is what they do. This is what their uh, literature review is. And you have many names there that I'm sure don't say that much to you, but they have references to these names. So I would say start your journey into the procedural approach with this uh, paper and their, um, the tools that they discuss. But again, we are here to, to, to take a look very closely at what they're doing. The main storyline remains that innovation should be in a certain way, and now we've learned how. It should be anticipative, it should be reflexive, it should be inclusive, responsive, blah, 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 but it is not. So the question is, how do we repair, or to use Colin Ridge's uh, terminology, how do we control, how do we control the reality of innovation? Okay. I want to leave this um, on before we um, go to on a small break. Yes, we're going to take a small break. So to sum up, we started with the distinction between the procedure and the process. I know I've repeated this many times and it's tedious, but I want you to, to, to keep that very steadily in your uh, hands. Because we started the way we started, the question before us, right, the, the approach frames the question, the question becomes one of uh, social control. More specifically, it becomes one of timing and means, timing and means, timing and means. How and when, or actually when and how, is it best to intervene in the process, in the name of the procedure, or in view of the procedure? And the standard answer we've seen in uh, Still Go and All is intervention techniques, right? Consensus conferences, science shops, user-centered design procedures, and all that, right? And before we take a small five-minute break, I want you, <laughs> I hope this is not annoying, but we will come back to this over and over again, and I want you to think about this, um, this saying, which is very powerful, but at the same time kind of strange. Reason and practice are just 
two kinds of practice. So when we will come back, I will ask you what you think Feyerabend means by this, uh, by this saying. Okay, now let me make sure everything... Um, Yes, that's true. Uh, Noah, very, very good. Uh, and you, Noah says, gas stations still say unleaded on the pumps. And you have to ask yourself, <laughs> why, right? You don't say unleaded sugar on sugar, even though it doesn't contain lead, right? Um, okay, so let's take a five-minute break. It is uh, 11.41. Let's uh, be back at, uh, let's say, 11.50, nine-minute break. Think about what Feyerabend said. And I will stop sharing my screen for now. And I'll see you back at uh, 11.50. So, the substantial or substantive approach to responsibility is, in fact, uh, you know, the procedural one was the more mainstream, but this one is, in fact, the more intuitive, the, more the, the one that is closest to our, um, the way we use the word and the way we um, apply the term uh, responsibility. And it actually starts from questions regarding, okay, what exactly is responsibility? And you can ask that question um, in an overarching sense, as a philosopher would. We're not going to do that now, but you can, you can ask, okay, what is this thing? What is this responsibility thing that I'm supposed to be uh, concerned with? Or you can ask uh, the question with regard to a specific um, situation. Okay, what is the responsible thing to do here? What is the responsible thing to do now? And because it starts with focusing on a responsibility, is less concerned with, okay, how should I act? How should I intervene? What is the timing? What are the means, right? The questions that we've discussed uh, this, uh, until now. But they're more concerned with on what ba it's like a step backwards. They're concerned about, okay, on what basis am I making this distinction between procedure and process? On what basis am I saying that such and such is good and such and such is bad, such and such is responsible and the other thing is irresponsible? Um, looking at the case studies, why exactly, why exactly are we saying that uh, Midgley was irresponsible? And why exactly, I'm, you know, giving off some of the uh, things that I uh, try to say about the uh, cases, why exactly does it feel less so or differently in the case of the DDT, right? So it's more concerned with the ideal on the basis of which um, distinction between responsible and irresponsible can be made in the first place. So, let's talk about, I hope I've said enough at this point that you understand that I'm not an idiot, uh, but I, I will talk about a very simple case. And I understand that, of course, the reality is much more complex, but it's not. Um, it's going to be worth starting with this very, very simple approach. So, Emily spilled the milk, right? The procedural approach would be to say, okay, what went wrong? How can the process be improved? Do we need better glasses? Do we need somehow for Emily to have a better grip? Was the milk too hot? Was the milk too cold? Was the table maybe, maybe uh, wobbly? Think again about the, that timing and uh, means, right? How can, to, can we intervene? Uh, when can we intervene? Sorry. Who should intervene? So on and so forth, right? This is the procedural approach. Something bad happened. Emily spilled the milk or some you know, company polluted the lake or whatever. We have to ask questions about the process. Now, the substantive or substantial approach asks, well, what's wrong with the milk being spilled? What is an acceptable amount of spilled milk? And in fact, I would say, maybe that's not the best formulation, I would say even backwards, on what basis? On what basis are we to decide what an acceptable amount of spilled milk is? Why should the milk not be spilt? Are there better alternatives to the milk not being spilt? You know, what, what are the, the values at stake? What, are the, the, what is the dialogue between the alternatives? And what are the values involved? Cleanliness, I guess, of the, what is that, a table versus what? If Emily is um, a year old and uh, she's just learning how to drink from the bottle, 
right? Then it might be a good thing that the milk is being spilled because she's playing with the milk and she's learning and she's being innovative and she's solving problems with motion with the hands that don't work, right? So spilled milk can also be a good thing. So the substantive approach, I hope you feel it from these questions, the substantive approach takes a step backwards and it is, let's say philosophically speaking, prior to the procedural approach because it asks what exactly is under that red thing? Remember the red was the ideal and the procedure and the um, model. What exactly is under there? This is the substantive approach. Now, one way to sum up is to think about it in this way. The procedural approach asks how did we get to this situation and how should we act moving forward, right? Two extremely important questions, but they're different from the question, what exactly is in our apparatus, in our philosophy, in our ideals, in our assumptions, what exactly is there that makes us make this distinction between red and blue? What exactly is the good versus bad that we're dealing with? And that is substantive because what it mean, what it, uh, the, the, um, the reason the term substantive is used is because it has to do with the very essence of the word responsibility that we're, that we're using. We don't have to be you know, Platonists or Aristotel Aristotelians to think that every concept has this uh, ideal uh, form out there and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. It just means that we're asking questions about the basis, the substance on which we make these distinctions in the procedural approach, the red versus blue distinction. And um, I want to give you another example, and I also have a question for you here. Um, the thing is, the substantive approach is used every day. It's used by people that are not even within the field of uh, responsible innovation, and it's typically used when they have to make certain decisions. Um, and not necessarily look at what is the, how was the process and how was, you know, what led to that when they look at certain um, innovations. So, at one point, um, I didn't, you know, I'm not going to bother you with the details, but at one point, someone discovered the x-rays, right? I, maybe you know they were discovered by chance, but x-rays turn out to be extremely good for a lot of things, right? We're seeing through materials, it's crazy that we can even do that, right? Diagnostics, crystallography um, for, you know, uh, looking into materials and the structure of materials. We use it for astronomy, for uh, radiation coming from the solar system. Think about everything, you know, security at the airport, uh, authentication when it comes to carbon dating and all that. X-rays are amazing. But they're also bad for health, right? Radiation poisoning is the most obvious one. It was immediately um, noticed. Uh, people were getting uh, bald spots on their head when they were x-rayed in the early days. And they were x-rayed constantly. It wasn't like nowadays that you get a, a shot, uh, like a photo being taken. You would just go under the x-ray and be under radiation for... Uh, you see it in cartoons nowadays that they walk behind this screen and they they are being uh, x-rayed um but it's bad for health right radiation poisoning was well known what they didn't know and what they didn't study was that it had um, you know it triggered um mutations into cells so it led to cancer they couldn't have known that because that is uh, an effect of exposure to long-term uh, it's an effect of long-term exposure right so good for diagnostics good for science good for astronomy good for society in a variety of ways bad for health. Well, at one point, the International Committee on uh, Radiological Protection, um, I think it was called differently in the beginning, but what is nowadays the ICRP, uh, gathered together and said, well, there needs to be limits, there need to be limits to how exposed you can be to this radiation. And one of the reasons why they got together was uh, that thing that you see in the image there, which um, I think it was called, oh yeah, you can see it, it's not very visible, but on the right side of the um, 
drawing you can see it's called PED ped o scope uh, not the best of names i will have to say but uh, it's exactly that so children would put their new shoes would put their new shoes into that uh, space and they would be blasted with x-rays for i don't know 20 30 seconds a minute in order to see whether their shoes fit uh, well and it's cases like these that triggered the international committee to come up with a limit right now I don't know what happened in that in those discussions of the committee uh, committee and I'm not sure how they ended up with the with the limit that is set today. I mean, we know that they initially said uh, 50 millisieverts a year and then they went to 20 and then they went to 10 and then you know gradually gradually to less and nowadays the accepted maximum a year is 1 millisievert. So you can do about um 10 uh, x-rays a year and you're almost certain as certain as you can be that there's no mutation going on of course people can also uh, do more um, but again they had a product in front of them and they had to ask themselves questions what is the value of the product set against is the costs right the, almost like a cost benefit uh, judgment and in doing so you bring in a certain ideal and you say well health is when let's say uh, you are not uh, your cells don't uh, mutate or where you're extremely healthy as you know there are different um, definitions of what it means to be uh, healthy right so when you look at uh, a situation like that you see that it has to proceed on the basis of a substantive notion of responsibility. So they look at all the data, they look at the benefits, they look at costs, and they say, well, innovation in this case is responsible if, I don't know, I formulated a rule just as a toy example, it causes little or no damage to skin cells, and the chances of cell mutations are statistically below 0.3%, right? At one point, you have to make a decision, and that 0.3% is, okay, this is our definition of safety. From the perspective of the 21st century ICRP member, safe is when, it, statistically speaking, it's below 0.3% that your cells mutate under the 1 millisievert uh, a year. I don't care how sieverts are uh, produced, I don't care what the technologies are there. It, the process is not yet. Of course, it will matter later. How do we implement this, etc., etc.? But the question is a substantive one. Now, so let's go back to our uh, stories now, right? And um, we have to ask ourselves, okay, so what is the substantive notion of responsibility that you used, right? Let's focus on the first one for now. You heard my story of uh, tetraethyl lead, right? And you said, more or less um, explicitly, you said, well, it is irresponsible, right? Uh, Thomas Midgley was irresponsible, or the government was irresponsible, or everybody was irresponsible. But now I want you to ask, what exactly is that principle behind that uh, judgment of yours? Try to formulate it, and I'll go back to the, to the if you don't want to intervene uh, with audio, try to look at that story one more time and try to formulate it. Try to come up with what exactly is behind your decision that this and that person was uh, irresponsible. Let's, let's, see what we, uh, let's see what we get. You can intervene, you can open up your mic, or you can uh, add, um, add something in the chat. So to help you think, I'm asking, you looked at, uh, without me saying anything, you looked at a situation and you thought, huh, this was so irresponsible, right? And let's, let's be clear about it, you were probably right, everybody knows it is a classic example. Okay. But why did you think that? What notion of responsibility were you using when you had that in mind? 
and look at the tetraethyl lead example and try to come up with something of a formulation. See how it sounds. Well, I think the, um, the burden of... Uh, wait, we have some uh, interventions. Let's see. You can think about it in... Um, give me a second. Yeah, you can think about it in these terms, right? This is what I did here. I looked at the notion of responsibility and I came up with an if-then statement. I said, innovation is responsible if uh, such and such. Or you can turn around, you can say innovation is irresponsible if uh, such and such happens, right? Let's see. You don't have to do it like that, but that, that would be an easy, easy way to formulate it. Let's see what we get. Or maybe people are just typing, nah, I don't care, go on with the lecture. <laughs> Let's see. Timo is uh, trying to type something. Yeah, you know, um, before, oh yeah, the, the stance refers to the battle between two values of getting profitable and uh, safety. Yeah, so uh, if I were to, yeah, exactly, so um, in the tell case, yeah. So uh, the, the principle would be something like that. Here it goes. I'll try to formulate it with, the, with what you focused on. Um, you should always put uh, safety or public health safety before uh, profits, right? In other words, it is responsible when safety is the more important value rather than uh, profits, right? And I can do that with the responses that I got in the beginning. So, um, Marcus, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Marcus um, said, Short-term benefits and effects are more taken into account than longer-term benefits and effects in both cases. Aha. Uh -huh. So the notion of responsibility would be you should always... Mm, let's uh, you, The complaint was that they're more taken into account. So let's say you should always take into account equally, maybe, um, short-term benefits and long-term effects. Something like that. Right? And I hope you get a feeling uh, right now for the problem we're about to encounter because, well, now here's my, um, my uh, response, right? I think that in the case of the DDT, the reason why we thought it was less irresponsible, might have been irresponsible as well, but the reason why the, the stories were different I think, and this is a you know personal reading of the cases, is that in the case of tetraethyl lead, we knew and they knew that there was an uh, that there was an alternative, and you can say one to one about the negative effects. You know, we can bracket that for now. Maybe they didn't, they couldn't conceive of uh, lead being accumulated to that effect, um, but there was an alternative out there. Whereas in the story of the DDT, without there being an alternative, the moment DDT was banned, and it was banned like this, within five years it was nowhere used on the globe except for one or two countries. I think it was Singapore and India or something like that. DDT is still not banned in India, by the way. Um, the moment uh, you banned it, without there being an alternative, it's very difficult in the case of DDD to say that uh, we should put, you know, um, safety of or like environmental concerns and uh, safety of humans before um, health, right? It's a more complex uh, reasoning there because there are no alternatives. So there's a bit of a what I will later call you will see moral overload. Okay, so the way I formulate it, uh, let me see if there's anything else in the chat. No. 
So there I formulated with, well, the principle here on the basis of which we felt that distinction was alternatives matter. In other words, when evaluating responsibility, uh, if uh, you're making a judgment of responsibility, then the presence or absence of alternative pathways should be factored in that judgment of responsibility. But of course, the other ones are equally good, and this is the kind of questioning that we have in a, in a substantive approach. Now, um, of course, at one point we have to ask ourselves, okay, but um, what is... Because we're not saying uh, responsibility in the case of lead, and we're not saying responsibility in the case of uh, DDT. And we're not saying responsibility in the case, more generally, of pesticides, right? So there seems to be, uh, at least at the level of how we approach these things, there seems to be a fundamental underlying notion of responsibility. So if you look at the examples of other technologies, right, and you try to do the same thing, you would probably come up with uh, different notions of responsibility. Or in any case, at first, right? What do we see in the first picture? We see the self-driving, autopilot, whatever, right? Now, what is responsible in the case of self-driving autopilot? Uh, the next picture is uh, nanotechnology. The next one is social media, TikTok, right? Remember how TikTok was first banned when they, sort of the Chinese company tried to uh, bring it into the United States and the Congress meeting and everything? Uh, they were working there with some form of notion of uh, responsibility. The same with Bitcoin, right? You have to ask yourself, okay, what is the responsible thing to do? And the same with nuclear, uh, nuclear energy. And the same with um, the, um, the process, yeah, the, 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 what is called the deep fake, right? Deep fakes are extremely difficult to, um, to discover, and especially AI-generated faces that look extremely natural. So what you do is you end up with the question, okay, so I have different cases where different notions of responsibility seem to be relevant, and I have to ask myself, what is behind these uh, notions of responsibility, right? It's kind of forced upon me, because let's look at the, at the examples that we uh, discussed. You say, um, there's a battle between, uh, Timo said, there's a battle between two valuables. Getting profitable, or making profit, right? So economic value and safety, which is a public value, a social value. Okay, but... On the basis of what are we saying that making profit is better than being safe? And of course, we also have to ask what exactly is uh, being safe and being profitable in this case, because there's always some sort of a risk, you know, uh, all the time. So I guess we have to define our terms. But when we start thinking substantially, it's as if we open a door that is very difficult to close again. Right? We have to ask ourselves again, why is it better to, I don't know, ban the Tesla autopilot than to allow it? Well, because of uh, saying, okay, but what is behind that um, limit there? Think about that one millisievert a year. Why one? Why not two? Why not 0 0.1? Why not no millisievert, no radiation, right? The response has to do, by the way, with the fact that we are in fact, already bombarded with quite a bit of uh, radiation from, the unit, from, the, from outer space, but it doesn't matter. The point is, once you start thinking substantially, like we're doing in the second part of the lecture, you end up in this, this looking behind, constantly looking behind. What is behind my judgment? And that is where the problem of the substantive... Remember, the Colling Ridge dilemma was the problem of the procedural approach... And here we have something that is called Munchausen's uh, trilemma, uh, from the stories of the Baron, uh, the Baron of Munchausen, who told all these ridiculous stories that everybody knew that he was lying, etc. I'll explain why it's called like that. Now we end up in this trilemma because when we are trying to formulate principles, like we've done with our examples now, 
we are in fact justifying a decision or justifying the use of procedures or tools uh, in a certain case based on that principle. And every time you have to do with justification, right, when you're, when, um, when you're trying to rationally justify something that you're doing, you end up in what is called justificationism, and that is you can always keep asking the question. So, we came up with Timo's uh, principle of responsibility, and we asked, okay, but what is that principle based on? And we say, okay, okay, let's answer that question. Timo's principle of responsibility is based on, and then we come up with another principle. And there's no reason why we shouldn't keep asking that. So the question is, where does it end? Right? Well, this is called a trilemma because in essence you have three ways that you can, um, you know, three equally bad. Remember that in a dilemma you have two options that are equally bad for some reason, for different reasons. And in a trilemma you have uh, three equally bad horns, right? Three equally bad reasons. First of all, you just keep going. You keep adding principles ad infinitum. Uh, let's do it. Uh, profitability is uh, less important than safety because safety is... Um, um, essential to human, I don't know, essential to human flourishing, right? Uh, okay, but uh, why do we want human flourishing? Well, we want human flourishing because uh, humans are, etc., etc., right? Uh, because that is the, the, the state in which, the safe state is the one in which the human being uh, uh, develops the most or the best, etc. Now, now, why would we want that, etc., etc.? Of course, it becomes more and more difficult to ask these questions, but you're engaged in rationally justifying your means, right? So it's never really off the table. The first one is ad infinitum. The second one is to say, well, this is where it stops, right? Um, Timo's principle is based on enough, another principle. Let's call it the principle of human flourishing, and that's it. No more uh, questioning. Of course, the problem with that is that such a stipulation, it's called, such a stipulation would be more or less arbitrary. You can always say, well, yeah, that's your stipulation, that's your dogma, that's your idea, but not mine. So this is also not extremely good. The second one is yeah, maybe a bit of a um, you know, technical issue. You can end up with the same principle. So... Um, I have the principle, uh, Timo's principle, and I say, well, let me try it. Um, safety is better than uh, profit because um, the human body is more important than um, objects, right? Well, because safety has to do with the human body and, uh, you know, money is an object, I'm kind of uh, uh, running in circles, right? So I can say, well, uh, safety is the most important because uh, it's best when you're safe or something like that. And I'm involved in circular reasoning. So this is known as, uh, this problem of justification is known as uh, Munchausen's uh, trilemma because at one point in some of those stories of the Baron of Munchausen, um, the guy told the story about him saving himself from a swamp and his horse by pulling himself by his own hair, right? And uh, because that resembles the circular part, right? There's a, you know, who's doing the pulling and who's doing the being pulled, then um, it's called Munchausen's uh, trilemma. And Hans Albert and Karl Popper are the two philosophers that are associated with this, uh, with this term. So... Why was uh, TEL uh, irresponsible? Well, because uh, TEL is toxic. Because we should, I'm at a number, I'm at A, right? Because we should ban toxic chemicals. Because we should protect the environment and it keeps going. Because it's a moral duty for future generations. Because God made it so, etc., etc. It makes, it, it is increasingly difficult to actually come up with an answer to the why, 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 why. But equally easy at every level to do so. The B would be, well, because it's self-evident that this and that and this and that, right? 
we stipulate something and we say, this is what it is. I'm not open to questioning anymore. It's self-evident that we should ban toxic chemicals. Um, now, uh, 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 running in circle, is, in circle would be uh, that tetraethyl lead was uh, irresponsible because to use it is not responsible or something like that. Of course, it's a silly example, but you would normally mask it in, uh, in other terms. You would say, why was TEL irresponsible? Well, because it was just crazy to use it. It was just a dumb idea that everybody, etc., etc., right? And what we're supposed to feel, just like we felt in the case of the Collingridge dilemma, is that neither of these are extremely satisfactory roads. Neither of these are extremely satisfactory answers, right? So we want to justify our... We want to be critical about what's under the hood, right? What's behind that red part of the distinction? What's behind the procedure? What's behind the ideal? Would be, But we bump into the Munchausen's trilemma. Just as when we wanted to intervene, you know, we want to, a response to innovation to be uh, put into practice. We want science to be more responsive, etc. We bumped into the Collingridge dilemma. Now, I want to say this is the only slide, I promise, where I'm just going to throw away some names, something that I promise not to do. Um, but I want to give you a feeling of what exactly is the way out of how do we escape Munchausen's uh, trilemma, right? And you'll have a lot of references. I'll give you um, structured references at the end. And if you want to read more on that, you can always uh, do so. But for now, I just want to give you a taste of how we can, uh, again, working in a substantive approach, how we can um, deal with this, uh, with this trilemma, right? First one, you might have heard of uh, this guy uh, in some basic philosophy classes. Uh, Karl Popper is one of the, the, the most well-known epistemologists of the 20th century. Um, so ep epistemology, that is the philosophy of science. And um, his first answer was uh, very popular in the, in the beginning of the 20th century and also later on, which is to say, we shouldn't try to justify our principles, our rules, our ideals at all. Justification ends, he accepted, remember he, he named it, right? Justification ends, like we said, in either ad infinitum or, you know, circular reasoning or this sort of um, psychological insistence that they're true. Instead of trying to justify them, so trying to build up, trying to work the basis, we just put them out there as irrational, not good, whatever, and we try to falsify them. So we formulate the principle, and then we try to contradict the principle. And whatever survives this attempt, whatever stands after we pick up our counterexamples and try to think of many, many, many counterexamples, whatever survives counterexample is good enough. Not because it's justified, keep in mind, not because it's justified, but because we know that given our examples, that is as good as it gets. So, we go back to uh, Timo's, uh, was it Timo? Uh, yeah, we go back to Timo's example and we say, safety is more important than money. And then we say, well, that cannot be the principle, Timo. Let me see if I can come up with a counterexample. That cannot be the principle because sometimes... You have to be extremely unsafe in order to, let's say, be free or extremely unsafe in order to do justice. You have to take risks for your, um, for your own safety, right? And the safety, maybe even the population, in order to uh, eradicate a different uh, risk, a different danger. I don't know if that's a good, uh, Timo, by the way. I'm not, um, you know, I'm not shooting at your principle just to show that it is good or bad. I'm just saying this would be the falsificationist uh, approach, right? And then we come up with a better one, probably more general one, and then we try to shoot that down, and that's how falsificationism works. Okay, that's Karl Popper. Uh, I live in Amsterdam here, and there's a bridge in Amsterdam uh, after uh, Karl Popper. I think that's the only bridge um, named after a 20th century philosopher in, I don't know, maybe Europe or the world. So, funny coincidence. Anyway, 
A second approach out of the trilemma would be to say, well, forget about it. Forget about falsification. Forget about justification. There is no one principle. There is no one principle. Remember that slide where we said, okay, what is behind these things? Isaiah Berlin, the second philosopher, um, says there's no point in looking for this one unified uh, principle because there are many principles and they are inconsistent with each other. And the fact is we need to maintain that inconsistency with each other because that's how they, they sort of cancel each other out. None of them dominates the, our conception of responsibility. So when you're trying to ask what is responsible or irresponsible about a past technology or a future technology, Isaiah Berlin would say, start with the case. Don't start with the with some sort of principle. Remember, we wanted to say we take a step backwards and try to come up with some fundamental formulation. Don't do that because he calls that, I will focus on him a bit in the next slide as well, he calls that a monist approach as opposed to being a pluralist. And finally, um, the only good-looking philosopher in this slide um, is the idea of uh, conservatism. Conservatism. Michael Oakeshott, one of the most famous uh, political philosophers of the 20th century, although he hasn't written that much, um, nor has Isaiah Berlin, by the way, um, says, well, let's be very critical about what we're doing. Why should we try to justify or rationalize or give reasons for a certain principle? What do we get out of that? He says, that is a rationalist inclination. To think that we can just mathematically decide or somehow compare and decide what is good and what is bad, or in our case, what is responsible and what is irresponsible. History has already done that for us, right? History works through some sort of self-selection, and we already have these principles that are already there in our culture. Think about how I started this lecture. Think about very how surprising, how amazing it is that I could tell you a story about this and that, and I didn't say anything about he was a bad guy, there was a good guy, and you came up with an answer. And even if you didn't contribute it to the chat, you came up with an answer and you said, that was bad, that was irresponsible. So Michael Oakeshott says, take that. Don't try to uh, innovate. Right? Progress is not necessarily uh, progress towards something good. Take that as a point of departure, because there is value in tradition, there is value in culture. So you see, um, falsificationism sort of tackles it head on, pluralism not really, it sort of undercuts the Munchausen's trilemma, and conservatism definitely undercuts the approach that uh, is used to formulate uh, trilemma. Now let's go into, I know this was the more, you know, the more philosophical slide, so let's go to our, let's see what time it is, okay, we're almost done. Uh, let's go to example of uh, pluralism, right? Like I said, you see here in the right side, we don't start with the idea that there is some overarching, unifying version of responsibility. Now... The reason why this is not the case is because in every single complex situation, when it comes to our um, tetraethyl lead, it's not just one or two values that we're uh, putting against each other. That would be amazing because that is a calculation we can make and that is a relatively easy way out. But there are very many. There are, you know, again, looking at, I don't know which ones, I guess it applies, applies to both of them. Safety from toxic elements. That's one value we have to take into consideration. Environmental protection. The birds and the eagles and the insects and the silent spring. Spread of deadly disease. Malaria. Keep malaria in mind. But also economic benefits. But also others. Justice in distributing risks. Liberty in choosing risks. Right? We, what, what I would have wanted in 1990s Romania is to be able to choose that whether my environment was polluted with lead or not. So it's also a matter of liberty in making that choice, or freedom in making that choice. This is what uh, Van den Hoven from uh, TU Delft uh, has called the problem, of, oh, it's not his 
terminology, but he identified it as the problem of moral overload. Every single, the simplest discussion of responsibility is in fact taking place in a context of moral overload. In other words, situations are so incredibly complex and because of that, so incredibly different that there is no one row, no one principle of responsibility. But in fact, and we have to learn to swallow this pill because it's not nice to work with, everything is more or less context dependent. So when we go back to our sets of technologies, remember, autopilot, nanotechnology, TikTok, uh, um, deep fake, nuclear, uh, there isn't one overarching notion of responsibility. And we have to learn to live with the, with the inconvenience that we cannot say from the very beginning, aha, uh -huh, I have my tools here, they work in every case, and I'm applying them right now, right? This would be how to apply pluralism in this, uh, in this case. Okay, we're um, approaching the, the end, and I want to make a summary of why, what I said, and I want to point out some way forward, especially in the context of you having to write that, uh, that essay from the perspective we've, uh, we've discussed. So, the key message is, is that the ideal of responsibility, when you hear people talk about responsible science and responsible innovation and all that, can be approached procedurally, which is to look at, focus on the process, right, the messy process, and um, sort of try to move things around and try to intervene and try to control, or can be approached substantially, which is to look critically at what people consider to be desirable or desired principles or desired ends. What we did in exemplifying is we took Timo's uh, principle or other principles and we asked ourselves, okay, he thinks that, maybe other people think that, maybe everybody thinks that, but why? What is behind that uh, principle? Why should I take that principle or not alternative principles? This is the main distinction, right? And what we've also seen that they each have their prototypical questions, the procedural approach uh, uh, and the substantive approach questions are on the right-hand side, and that they each have their prototypical problems. If you're focusing on the intervention, you bump into the dilemma of control. If you're focusing on the basis of your intervention, you bump into Munchausen's trilemma. Right? So, <laughs> fire up and uh, came back. I'm not going to drop it. Um, so, yeah, you might ask at this point, as a final question, you might say, well, that's all good, Mr. Popa, but how am I, what am I to choose? You know, how am I going to choose? I'm going to give you a lot of references. Which am I to, to read? You know, how am I going to approach my uh, case study? Well, you might have seen this coming from a kilometer away, but ideally, you take both the substantive or substantial. I've been extremely incoherent in using those terms, but they're used interchangeably. So you take both a substantial and a procedural approach, right? You take a substantive approach in being critical about the reasons you're doing what you're doing, and you're not afraid to ask questions that might at first formulation sounds stupid, but they are important philosophical questions. And you take a procedural approach by being critical about the reality. And you ask yourself, well, can this be done differently? How can this be done differently? Etc. Etc. Of course, when we put it like this, it sounds like a sensible uh, thing to do. But look how much we had to excavate and pull out in order to come up this with this, uh, you know, um, distinction and the the um, the c codes of uh, code of uh, conduct they uh, they suggest so what are the risks right uh, i think in, in applying both you should also be uh, aware of the risks well if you're doing procedural um, without doing the substantive right so if you're just taking still go at all and you read the hell out of that paper and you say, man, I understand and I'm going to do that. There are, some, there are some dangers there because 
you're not being critical about what's behind all that. You will read that paper, I think, and you will be very frustrated to find out that there's no answer to the question, what is responsible innovation? They talk about just about everything you can think of when it comes to responsible innovation, but they don't look at the, um, what's behind it. So you end up in uh, relativism, uh, you end up in window dressing, let's just do the, pr the procedure, uh, let's just do the process, this and that and this and that. Or you end up in empty jargon, well, it sounds so nice, you know, it has to be um, uh, responsive and it has to be inclusive and it has to be anticipative, an anticipative. but yeah, um, at, the, at the end of the day, these are just uh, things you do to modify uh, reality, you know, there's not... You don't, you're not looking at the reasons behind it. The risks of the substantive without, without the procedure might even be bigger because if you keep focusing on these ideals, right, and you take them uh, as posing the main questions, obviously, you, I think you got that by now, you end up in inefficiency. At one point, you have to stop or you have to pendulate between the substantive or the procedural. Otherwise, you keep keep being critical about what's behind the tool, you know, and you ask, well, why should we include people? Well, why should we be um, uh, democratic? Why should we democratize uh, science? And without looking at practice, you, you also end up uh, with uh, what Oakeshott identified as rigid uh, rationalism or uh, idealism. So, I promise not to, <laughs> not to leave you uh, be... And I guess you're all tired, so I'm not going to uh, expect, and it's also almost the end, and I'm not going to expect any uh, answers. But, oh, like, let, me s let me see if there's something in the chat. No, there's not. So, it, has anybody thought about this? Reason and practice are just two kinds of practice, what this means. Has anybody had the time to work on that in the back of their mind? Nope. <laughs> okay, well, let's... Let me give you my uh, explanation. When Feyerabend says reason and practice are just two kinds of practice, he's basically calling into question... Sorry for the, the horrible visual experience now, but I want to go here. He's basically calling into question this distinction. He's saying, well, you make this distinction between something that is good, the procedure, the rules, the ideal, and something that is... I use the word messy throughout, right? It was bad. It was uh, the reality, the actuality, the, the jungle of uh, the bows about the veil, right? The jungle of outside. But what you're doing, Mr. Evaluator, what you're doing, Mr. Philosopher, what you're doing, Mr. Scholar in Responsible Innovation, is just comparing two kinds of practice. In other words, the one that you love so much, Mr. Philosopher, and the one that you love a bit less because you think it needs to be changed. Reason, right, the ideal and the practice, the reality, are just two kinds of possible traditions. It's not immediately clear that when you hold on to an ideal and you love it so much and you want it to be the case, it's not clear that that ideal is a different kind of entity altogether, right? Reason and practice, the good and the actual, are just two kinds of possible actuals, right? If I may use the term like that. Reason and practice are just two kinds of practice. So it's a critique on people who try to implement certain ideals taking for granted this uh, distinction and not thinking on what's under the hood, not um, being critical about what exactly is behind that real, that uh, rule, that ideal, that reason. So in essence, that's the joke. In essence, it's, um, it's something that triggers you. You know, it's a very um, enigmatic statement, but it triggers you to think critically about this distinction that you're making. What am I taking to be amazing? And what am I thinking to be less than amazing? And why is that the case? Because Feyerabend, uh, Mr. Popa told me, suggested that they are the same kind. The only difference is that I, I like one more better than the other. 